Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Advancing Open Data Within the Geo Work Plan Through New Tools and Services session. I should say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm not sure which time zone you're in. I'm Kathy Fontaine, representing ESIP, and I will be your moderator today. Our agenda is also posted on the website for this meeting, so just a quick review. Um, we're going to hear from Helen Glaves and Chris Schubert uh, on the key messages from the data analysis survey that was done this year. Um, you all participated in that, I hope, and we're going to get some really good information from that. Henrik Anderson, Henrik Stein Anderson is going to talk about our in-situ data strategy, sharing data management principles, success stories, which are always things that we want to have within GEO. We want to see the way people have used the concepts and tools that we've come up with. It's going to be presented by Jose Miguel Rubio. We have a dialogue series that we just started. Um, Marie-Francoise Boidon is going to talk about that. There's a self-assessment tool being developed for, or has been developed for the geo data management principles and FAIR principles. And Lionel Menard is going to talk about that. Simon Hudson will be discussing World FAIR, which talks about cross-domain grand challenges. And I'm really looking forward to this one. And then Konstantinos Repanis is going to bring up the subject of how funders value the data sharing and data management plans and the work that we've been doing. Now we are going to hold all questions till the end. However, next slide, please. If you have a question, here are our speakers. Next, thank you. Um, if you do have a question, please put the question in the chat as, you, as we go along and I'll be collecting those for discussion later. For simplicity, for um, uniformity, please change your name in the Zoom to your organization and then your name so we know who's represented. Please make sure that you've muted your audio when you are not speaking. If you do have a, Q a question during the Q&A session, please raise your hand. I can see all the hands going up um, and I'll call on you in turn. And please direct your intervention as much as possible to um, one panelist, but if other panelists want to answer, we'll have time for that. There will be several polls launched during this session. So please be on the lookout for a poll popping up. You'll have a few minutes to answer that question and that information is very important to us. Be aware, we are, being, we are recording this meeting. Your image and your voice will be recorded. Finally, follow us on Twitter at, at Geosec2025 with hashtags, hashtag EO4Impact. So first up, we have Helen Glaves with key messages of the data analysis survey. Helen? Great, thank you very much, Kathy. Hi, everybody. Um, just to say a quick few words about um, the, the presentation. Uh, I'll actually be giving the presentation on behalf of my, myself and Chris Schubert who is the uh, other contributor, major contributor to this presentation. But I also want to take this opportunity to also thank everyone who's participated in the survey and everyone who's been involved in compiling the results thus far. So I wanna just quickly uh, give a little bit of context to this presentation. So I'm gonna start off just by saying a few words about the data working group within the context of GEO. So the data working group is working with the GEO community and with other stakeholders to address data policy, data ethics, data governance issues that actually impact the use of Earth observations and um, seek to improve the uptake of Earth observations. The data working group itself is made up of experts that provide insights into current international open data and data management practices. And we make recommendations for revising the GEOS data sharing principles and the GEOS data management principles and implementation guides as and where appropriate. The data working group is also aiming to advance discussions concerning the sharing and management of Earth observation data information and knowledge resources with stakeholder communities and to make recommendations on how GEO can advance the interoperability of Earth observations and complementary data products and services. 
So the data working group also has four component subgroups dealing with specific topics around in situ data, the data sharing and data management principles I've just mentioned, law and policy, and data and ethics. So within the context of the data working group, um, the, there has been a survey uh, of the geo work program activities and an analysis has been carried out. So just to say, firstly, a few things about um, the, the, the sort of the priorities for um, this survey and why the data working group has conducted this survey of the geo work program activities. The objectives of this activity were really to understand whether data and services that are used by the geo work program activities are registered in the GEOS platform, whether they're open and shared and complied with the geo data sharing and data management principles. We also wanted to determine if there was a need for the geo work program activities to address specific issues around accessibility and availability of in situ data. So to better understand, are there barriers um, to the use of in situ data, but also the same, a similar approach for satellite data that are not yet freely open and available. We also wanted to better understand the implications for the geo work program activities of adopting the geo data sharing and data management principles and potentially identify champions in the geo community that are adopting and implementing the geo data sharing and data management principles um, in order to be able to, to highlight some success stories uh, around the, the, the different activities in the geo work program. Um, there is a link in this slide, um, which um, I think the slides will be shared later, which actually will allow you to have a look at the geo work program um, activities data analysis that we've carried out as a result of this survey. So I want to say a little bit about how we've gone about analysing the survey results and also what our next steps have been. So a data dashboard has been created to allow us to assess the feedback that we received from the geo work programme activities that have already completed the survey. I take this opportunity to remind those geo work programme activities that haven't completed the survey um, that this is an opportunity to provide insight into these specific issues, but also through completing this survey, um, you can get further help from the data working group as part of your implementation plan. So I would encourage you to, to complete the survey if you haven't already done so. So I want to say a little bit about specific outcomes from the survey thus far. Um, as you can see, the, the issues that we've addressed have been around um, the barriers to use of in situ data and the barriers to, to other input data. And then initial analysis of, the, of this input from the survey has shown us um, some, some very key um, barriers that are identified across the board, whether the geo work program activities are dealing with in situ data or dealing with uh, other types of earth observation input data. So key barriers that have been identified by all of those that have um, completed this survey thus far, thus far um, ha that have been identified are around licensing of data. Licensing is an issue for reuse of data for different applications. There is also an issue of coverage. Um, so this is an issue around um, whether there is sufficient resolution whether there are gaps in the data that need to be addressed. The other issue that was very clearly highlighted in the survey was the around the timeliness of the data. Is it available in a time frame that makes it useful for the geo work program activities? So we went on in the survey to then ask how do the geo work program activities have responded to this survey? How do they feel that geo, what could geo do to fill in the data gaps. And it was fairly clear that there were a whole range of different things that it was felt GEO could be doing in order to improve the availability and the reuse of in situ and earth observation gen data in general, general within the GEO work program activities. And these very much focused around supporting projects and funding opportunities, 
but also encouraging adoption of standards and guidelines for data throughout the geo community. There was also a consensus that geo could be providing infrastructure solutions. So the geos platform, the geos knowledge hub, but also communications and raising awareness clearly was felt to be important. There was the all of the geo work program activities that we've consulted as part of this process have very much emphasized that geo has a very strong role to play in terms of communicating with data providers, raising awareness of these issues as well, both within the geo community, but also more widely. So in order to actually understand uh, in more detail what the issues that were flagged by the geo work program activities in the context of the online survey, um, the next step has been to conduct a number of engagement calls with those geo work program activities that have completed the survey. And again, I'd take this opportunity, if you'd like to actually contribute uh, to these engagement calls, um, we would really encourage you to either complete the survey or contact the data working group directly, um, because we will be conducting further engagement calls in the future that won't just be focused on those that have contributed to the survey thus far. So just to say a few words about the engagement calls, um, the initial setup of these calls was around selected geo work program activities that we draft, we developed a number of targeted questions that built on the survey. And we used this methodology to try and make sure that we got some consistent engagement with the different geo work program activities to allow us to synthesize the feedback that we got during these discussions. Um, I have to say that thus far, we've only done a relatively small number of these engagement calls, but they've already thrown up a number of key issues that we can build on for the future in terms of directing the activities within the subgroups and also at the data working group le level. It is also worth saying that the outcome of these, the survey and the engagement calls the conclusions from these will form the basis for future geo recommendations around uh, data use and um, reuse, and also that um, it will be used as the basis for developing the in situ data strategy, um, which Heinrich will, will talk about after this presentation. So with regards to synthesizing the, the feedback that we've received from the geo work program activities, um, we've, we've worked on creating a matrix that identifies what are the challenges I, that the geo work program activities have encountered with regards to uh, data use and data reuse. We wanted to look at what is the actual specific impact for the geo work program activities, and then how can geo help? I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail because that's not really possible in 10 minutes, but I just wanna pick out some of the key points that, that came out of, of, this, uh, of the, these engagement calls. And I think one of the things that, that came across very clearly from all of the geo work program activities that we've spoken to this, thus far has been the lock of, lack of common standards and best practices and also fragmented data policies that hamper data access and reuse. And there are a number of solutions that GEO um, could implement or already has um, expertise or infrastructure available that would allow um, us to move forward in terms of addressing this challenge. So GEO could be promoting wider adoption of the data sharing and data management principle, principles, and other relevant standards. Also, GEO could be encouraging members and funders to recommend use of active data management plans, but also GEO can provide expert guidance to the, to the community and also the GEO Knowledge Hub and also the Data Working Group Dialogue Series are an opportunity to both raise awareness, to communicate, but also to exchange knowledge on, on common standards. I also just want to highlight the fact that this slide actually goes over into, into two slides because 
The engagement calls have given us a lot of feedback from the different geo work program activities. One of the other challenges that very clearly came across um, as part of this uh, survey with the geo work program activities has been the issues around funding models that limit the further development and impact of the medium and long term sustainability for some of the activities. Some geo work program activities reported they need to identify ongoing sources of funding. Data is lost due to a lack of funding after projects end. Sensor networks are not necessarily maintained in the medium to long term. So how can GEO help here? Well, once again, GEO can provide the data infrastructure for data preservation through um, the GEO data infrastructure. Um, GEO can also raise awareness and provide training such as on licensing restrictions. It can also explore options for funding of GEO work program activities with key partners for the future. So this, these two slides that I've just presented here are very much a synthesis of a wealth of information that we have received from those GEO work program activities that we've already uh, engaged with. Um, and I would encourage those geo work program activities who have not already been part of this process. If you're interested, then please do complete the survey, but also um, there is an opportunity to be part of the engagement calls as well. So I just want to summarize by um, emphasizing the role of the geo data working group in supporting the geo work program activities. So Key roles for the data working group are about prom around promoting wider adoption of principal standards and practices. I've mentioned several times the data sharing and data management principles, but we also need to consider the technical and capacity sharing. We need to provide recommendations on federated data infrastructure, data formats, vocabulary services. I could go on, the list is, is endless. Um, but we also need to have greater engagement of the GEO members because we need to encourage good data management practices at the national and regional level. So, for example, I mentioned adoption of data management plans, but we also need to emphasize the value of the GEO work program activities at the national and regional levels. And we need to foster wider participation and support for these very valuable activities. So if you're interested in being part of these activities, you can join the data working group dialogue series, also complete the survey. And um, as I've already mentioned, uh, there will be further engagement calls planned um, before the summer. Uh, and we're already thinking about how those will be structured and, and what the next priorities will, for those, will be for those engagement calls. Next slide, please. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up at this point. And once again, I'd like to thank my, my co-author, Chris Schubert, but also everyone else who's been part of the data working group survey and engagement calls thus far. So thank you, Kathy. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, we have a list amongst ourselves of things that we want to make sure we mention during the presentations. And Helen had something that she actually mentioned three times. You win the prize, Helen, thank you. <laughs> and if any of you know what that was, please put it in the chat. <laughs> Next up is Henrik Steen Anderson, who will talk to us about the implications of in-situ data strategy for the geo work plan activities. Henrik is from the European Environment Agency and we've heard from a couple of EEA representatives this week. So take it away, Henrik. Thanks a lot, Katy, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. Uh, next slide, please. What I'm going to do is to very briefly introduce you to the in-situ data strategy and, um, and the rationale, uh, rationale behind it and the purpose of it. Um, and you could also ask, I mean, is it really so that we need an in-situ data strategy? In fact, there is a push from, from the General Assembly, from the top, you could say, that, um, and, and you have here the, uh, a, a, an extract from the Can Canberra um, Declaration a few years ago. So we need to recognize the critical role of in-situ data. Uh, 
we need to engage with the com community and we need to get access to more to more data and why is this simply because many of the geo work program activities they need access to essential c2 data to produce and validate the product and services and to meet end user requirements in fact so this is not true maybe for all geo work program activities but for many um, many of them actually struggle to get the in situ data they need to, to meet uh, key end user requirements. So there's a clear push from activities, geo work program activities, and from the general assembly that we need to do more in this area. So please, next slide. So what is the, really the purpose? I mean, in pro, in, I, I've, I've mentioned three, three, uh, three elements here and you could maybe add more, but in fact, the way I see it is that we need uh, this uh, geo strategy to lead to more essential in situ data being made available to the geo work program activities. I mean, that's the key thing, isn't it? That we want to, to, uh, to ensure that more essential data are available. We need to strengthen the cooperation between GEO and important in situ data providers. This is this is can this can only be done in in uh, in uh, in a cooperative and, and coordinated way. So we need to work with in situ data providers, and we need to find a good way to do this. And of course, we need to optimize internal sharing within GEO of data, knowledge, and solutions. As also mentioned by Helen already. I mean, many geo work program activities are working on this. They have ideas. They have they have uh, maybe also set up um, data access uh, uh, solutions. They have knowledge about how to work with data providers. They have knowledge about license conditions and things like that. And I think we have an enormous amount of knowledge and maybe also data and solutions within GEO that we should try to share uh, more in the future. So we actually, the data working group and the in situ data subgroup, we have already uh, produced a draft uh, in situ data, GEO uh, in situ data strategy. We presented it to the program board and we got some, some, uh, some recommendations back. So you can see them here. So this is really our foundation in a way our basis for the work that we that we have been doing until now and the work we will be doing in the future so we need to engage within 60 networks of course we try to 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 pass on uh, requirements from the geo uh, community to in situ data providers and we need of course to have this dialogue to get to get access to more data we need to identify common barriers and that was exactly what was helen was talking about uh, before, what are the key barriers? Uh, we have already now a good idea, um, data license issue, uh, timeliness issues, coverage issues, and we need to find way to, ways to, 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 to solve or to uh, overcome some of these barriers. Uh, and of course, again, the knowledge that we have already within GEO is important and we need to, to, uh, to base, uh, base our solutions and ideas on, 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 on existing knowledge. And that is also really the purpose behind these engagement calls that we get this dialogue. We know about what's going on in the different GEO work program activities and we can pass on this information uh, as an inspiration to other activities. We need to prioritize observations needed and we need to focus on practical actions. And again, uh, these engagement calls and the analysis is really a, a, a practical action. And we, we, we don't want to create um, uh, reports that will only collect dust. We need to, to find practical solutions and practical actions. Next slide, please. So, I mean, if we want to be successful, if we want to implement this into you, uh, this geo in situ data structure in a, in a good and constructive way, I mean, we need to work together. This, this is clear. And we need, of course, to work with in situ data providers. Uh, we need to have uh, data sharing and management principles in, 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 in order so we can pass them on. We can advocate for open data. We need to communicate. We need to increase the awareness uh, uh, with, um, among the in situ data providers. Why is it so important that these data are be, be, being made available to geo work program activities? And we need, of course, to pass on the, the, the requirements. But, and I think also I would like to, to focus on this, 
there is also a need for internal coordination and sharing. I mentioned it before, but I think really we, we should harvest and, uh, and, and leverage the, um, the enormous amount of knowledge and, and, and data and solutions already available. So this is, this is the, 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 the only way in a way to, to, to implement this uh, in situ data strategy. This is by, by working together. I mean, we need to work together at all levels so the uh, uh, the geo work program activities, the uh, data working group, uh, regional geos, uh, geo governance bodies, and the secretariat, we, we all need to to come together and try to find the right way to to uh, to, um, to 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 solve this important issue and to actually make more at the end make more uh, essential in situ data available to the geo work program activities. Uh, the only way you can do this and implement the, the geo in situ data structure is, is by working together also in, internally. Uh, this is not something that can be done by the data working group alone. This is something which will require uh, a lot of work at all levels. Um, what we have been doing until now is that, uh, as I said, we, will, we, we are now responding to the recommendations from the program board, so we have a, a work plan in place. We have these engagement calls, uh, they are ongoing and hopefully they will be more in the future. And we have also, and we are also looking at, at some of the data sharing and management principles, is there a need to change them uh, uh, and to adapt them to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to the uh, new system. Uh, new uh, situation. So um, let's take the next slide, please. So the data working group is really here to support you uh, in your planning. And uh, it's uh, with respect to in situ data uh, related issues and activities. We have these uh, engagement calls with GEO work program activities, and we would like to use them as a way to gather more information, uh, to share ideas, and to find out how best to distribute this within, within GEO and also to the in-situ data providers. And I have a question for you here at the end. So do you have success stories regarding in-situ data to share? And again, this is actually quite important because uh, by sharing success stories, you also inspire other people on how to, to solve some of, some of these key barriers. So success stories are really great and important. We should not always uh, focus on the gaps. Uh, there are a lot of success stories and we would like you to share some of them with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any of you who have success stories, you can go ahead and put them in the chat or send an email to Henrik and uh, we will be happy to follow up with you to document those and um, see how they can, how they relate to the Institute process. Now we're going to have some more success stories, data sharing and management principles success story, stories. Jose Ru Miguel Rubio from EEA will be presenting this, and I believe we'll also be presenting the very next one as well. Exactly, exactly. Yes. I finally saw my email. <laughs> okay. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kathy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Jose Rubio. I work together with uh, Henrik Estin Anderson in the at the European Environment Agency, and I'm also a member of the Geodata Working Group. And I will uh, lead you uh, in the next uh, presentation on success stories about the implementation of geodata sharing and management principles. So uh, next slide, uh, Rick. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you all know you, most of you, I'm sure, have been in, in geo working uh, with us for many years, and you know how the data sharing principles are at the core of the organization of Group on Earth Observation. Uh, since the beginning, uh, GEO has recognized how, uh, that the societal benefits of Earth Observation can only uh, be fully achieved if we share data, if we share knowledge, if we share information. Uh, and, and then it, when it came the geodata sharing principles, and in, in 2015, uh, if you some of you remember when we took the step to the second decade of geo, uh, we also took the step forward to advocate the fully open uh, data policy in the geodata sharing principles, advocating for full uh, and open data and metadata that the registration and attribution uh, only in, uh, requiring registration and attribution if necessary with minimal restrictions uh, when open data cannot be uh, made 
and of course, a minimum time delay for the Earth observations. Um, at the same time, in order to fully maximize the value and benefits arising from Earth observation, also in 2015, we uh, endorsed and published the geodata management principles, which complement very well the data sharing principles by advocating discoverability, accessibility, usability, preservation, and curation of Earth observation, facilitating the interoperability, that the use of common standards, the possibility of integrating data together with models in order to facilitate decision making based on, on Earth observation data and information. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, this uh, data management data sharing principles are as actual and up to date as, as possible. Uh, we also created uh, a series of guidelines which we need uh, we need to to still have a look and making sure that it's aligned with the latest developments in terms of technology. And we are actually working precisely on this update. Uh, so stay tuned because we, we soon will come up with an update on these uh, guidelines uh, which are implementing this data management data, uh, data sharing principles. Uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, this, this work of updating uh, and reviewing and making sure that the guidelines are up to date with the current status of technology um, is, is, is a work that is being done by the data working group and in particular by the um, led by the data sharing and management principles subgroup. Uh, this uh, subgroup to which I, I belong and is chaired by, by Chris Schubert. Uh, is focused basically on, on ensuring this interface with the geo work program activities to identify barriers, challenges to data sharing, data management, and also to, to, to try to, to look for solutions and try also uh, ultimately to advocate the implementation of the data management data sharing principles. We have a work plan and uh, we have a series of strands, so to speak, of actions. One is a uh, basically on describing the status of uh, implementation of the data sharing data management principles. This is where we can, we can uh, somehow allocate this activity of, of reviewing the guidelines uh, that I mentioned before, but also the contribution to this uh, data survey that Helen has explained, as well as a series of studies and analysis on how this data sharing data management principles relate with other set of principles like, a, like a fair trust, care, and so on. But I wanted to focus in this presentation very briefly on the second strand, which is more on how, uh, how can be further the uptake of uh, the data sharing, data management principles. And then we can focus basically on two main actions, so to speak. One is the identification of success stories, and you may ask with but actually it's a success story, and I will mention that uh, in a second. Another, uh, which is the subject of the next presentation, is the uh, dialogue series on data management data uh, sharing principles. That's a, a typo in the slide, uh, which uh, also tries to, 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 again, advocate the implementation of these principles uh, by the community. Uh, and then, of course, we are trying as well to address changes in the context of open science and open knowledge. And next slide, please. Yeah, uh, success story, you, you may think, what, what is a success story? Success story can be many things. Basically, we are here trying to identify, identify champions uh, who are implementing data sharing and data management principles. The implementation of data management principles covering a total of 10, manage, uh, 10 principles can be uh, very complex or can be very comprehensive. We are not looking for uh, communities or initiatives that have implemented everything. We're really looking for those who the implementation on one several principles have created an impact, benefits, uh, have created results in their, in their activities. That's a success story. Uh, but it's also a success story, and, and I will mention that uh, in my slides. Also, uh, all the activities that the initiative have implemented or carried out in order to be compliant with the principles that we would like also to highlight, to, to share with the community how the process was carried out in order to comply with the different set of, of principles. So we are compiling these stories in um, in a sort of a document, which we will, of course, make available, where we want to understand from the community what they have done related to the principles. Again, it doesn't need to be comprehensive, but maybe focus on a set of principles or areas, why they did it, what the, the challenges are, 
uh, in, in the, that they found or they met when they were implementing uh, the, uh, the principles in their, in their working, in working processes and in the institutions, how they overcame the challenges, uh, what, what they feel they were the key success factors, what are the benefits uh, that they can quantify or they can identify in their activities after having implemented the principles. And well, a series of, of also information to, to make sure that others who want to, to follow their steps can, can contact them. And next slide. Yes, we, we have done already some, some address some examples of some stories, one very, very uh, clear uh, and very known for many of you is, is actually uh, the Copernicus program, the Earth Observation Program of the European Union, which has a uh, full open data policy. Uh, this uh, is actually a policy that uh, in which there is no restriction uh, on use and reproduction and redistribution with or without adaptation for commercial and non-commercial use of all the data and information generated this, uh, within this program, Sentinel mission data or Copernicus service information. Uh, it, the geo data sharing principles are actually included in the, in the Copernicus data policy. Um, and uh, we have been able to identify a series of challenges which we have included in this success story. Of course, when we open as, uh, data, uh, there are of course also issues say to, for example, security, copyrights, um, national interest, technical reasons that we have to consider. Uh, also, the fact that it's a, a European program making available a lot of data for everyone in the world, which can also have a consideration in competitiveness as well. Uh, but yeah, we have identified a series of success factors and benefits. And just to quote a bit, uh, definitely uh, the, the opening up of this uh, data and information has, has been definitely a global game changer in their observation. And they have even quantified this uh, in the sense that they uh, it's considered that they will generate billions, um, around 100 billion in benefits to the society uh, between 2017 and 2035, 10 to 20 times the cost of the service and the infrastructure. So it's just to say that there is a clear benefit and we are trying to collect this in the success story. But we don't need to be, this is a huge success story, of course, but we, we are not looking only to, to huge success story, but also to success stories um, maybe of a, of a different scale. Um, and as I was saying, if you go to the next slide, uh, Henrik, uh, Rick. Uh, also, we don't want also to focus on the results in itself or the impacts of benefits, but also on how institutions and community initiatives are actually implementing this and how they are overcoming the challenges. Uh, this is the case of, of, of um, our friends from the International Atomic Energy Agency. They are running the uh, Marine Radioactivity Information System, which allows free access to users to obtain, search, and download results, uh, results of measurements of radioactivity in seawater, uh, biota, sediment, and suspended matter from different uh, sources. Uh, they have a million of measurements. They have a very nice website uh, where you can see uh, the different information measurements, samplings per type, per sampling depth, and so on. Uh, next slide. Uh, they, again, it's, it's a great uh, website. They have a lot of information, but with data which is fully referenced and acknowledged, but they still, they came to us, to the data working group to understand uh, how uh, metadata uh, or how could they standardize the metadata that they have, how, wh which were the tools that they could use, um, and also how could they make sure that this data that they are putting there in Maris can be harvested by the GeoPortal uh, in view of also making from Maris, which is still a pilot, to a big open data portal. So after a series of discussions with us, they came to a series of questions like which metadata standards should we adopt? What are the minimum metadata parameters to comply with the data management principles and FAIR principles? And what tools are available for, uh, for the creation of metadata? And next slide. So we, uh, the data working group uh, came to the assistance of the, of the colleagues from IEA. Uh, we had a meeting on 9th of March where we discussed overall questions and uh, the colleagues from my uh, Min Paris Tech, uh, Lionel Menard, who will also sp uh, speak later, uh, they had a very, very fruitful uh, discussion about how um, 
uh, the colleagues from uh, Min Paritech have have done or have approached the different issues that they had, of course, in, the, in, in this case, in the in the domain of renewable energy, but uh, helping, so to speak, to the colleagues to to try to 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 find first question uh, answers to the questions that they had. Um, all this to 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 conclude that uh, the data working group uh, in, in this context, the, the subgroup is is actually a forum where we can really help the community to take the first steps into the implementation of the of the data sharing, data management principles, uh, where we can also see how um, the, the benefits of implementing we can already start seeing it in how the colleagues from IEA are already getting the information and how are starting to to work uh, for in uh, our our knowledge and information that we we can share of course this is also a call to other colleagues working in, the, in a similar field uh, here in the geo community to, to also provide uh, help and and collaborate in this in this context and uh, yeah i think uh, the the key message here is that um success stories and champions can can also be those who are fighting their way and implementing the the principles uh, and how the data working group can help the initiatives in in running in, in yeah in going through this path uh, towards was compliance of the geodata sharing and management principles. I think that was um, all what I wanted to say, uh, Kathy. Uh, I also will speak in the next, so I don't know if you want to, to say something now or I just should follow. Well, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. Let me let you mentally adjust to the new um, person that you're going to be. <laughs> Thank you. And um, uh, Jose Miguel Rubio is standing in for Marie Francoise Gaudreau, who is working on the dialogue series as well. Um, I also want to take a second to mention that I'm not really going through the bios because you can see those on the on the website if you hover over and click on the uh, photos of the the headshots of all the people who were speaking this week. And I do want to take a minute right in the middle of this to embarrass the folks in the back. Um, thank you to Rick and Wenbo and Florian and everyone else who's been working behind the scenes to put this together. We're going to have a poll in a few minutes, so stay tuned. Go for it. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Cathy. And indeed, as you say, I'm standing here for my François uh, Boitreau, um, who unfortunately cannot be uh, here today. Also, I want to acknowledge the, the work by by Bente Lilia B, uh, who was, uh, is also involved in the preparation of the data sharing data management and dialogue series together with the Geo Secretariat. So next slide. Yeah, it will be a very short uh, presentation. I just wanted to 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 let you know about this activity, which has uh, recently started also as part of the data working group and as part of this effort of, 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 of uh, raising awareness about uh, what the data sharing, data management principles are. And also uh, something that Henrik mentioned before, which is uh, to build on the community uh, so we can help each other into, into reaching the compliance or advance on the implementation of the data sharing principles. So this uh, dialogue series, uh, we have a series of, 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 of let's say, um, webinars planned um, from June to, to October, November. Um, the idea again is to, to um, have a specific webinars on topics such as data lifecycle, data sharing principles. And then because you know there are 10 data management principles, we want to go a bit more in detail uh, and then we have five uh, webinar series after summer covering each of the different categories of principles, discoverability, accessibility, usability, preservation, and curation. Uh, what is important here is that, and, and I wanted also to, to link it to my presentation before, when we were speaking with the colleagues of the International Agency on Atomic Energy, um, we realized that actually, and they, they told us how, at the beginning, how abstract this data management, data sharing principles really look like. So there is there is clearly a need to, to go beyond the, the principles itself, document maybe better, we have the guidelines and that's why we are reviewing them, but also take a step forward into try to bring what, what these principles are in 
examples of implementations to the community. So that is what we want to, to try here, uh, but we want to do it with you, actually, and that is basically a, a call for for those who are interested in participating in this uh, dialogue topics, because you have experience on, for example, the creation of a catalog uh, with standard metadata or the like creation of a standard uh, interfaces for accessing data, or because you have worked in preservation or curation, because you have a, you have a struggle, but you have managed to have an open data policy. Uh, you are super welcome to to contact us, uh, so we can we can define a webinar in which uh, you can you can show your experience, you can bring your uh, also the challenges and uh, how you mitigated them, and also to what were the benefits that the implementation brought to your uh, to your uh, initiative. Yes, um, of course we we will uh, try to also give a perspective fo focus on also the areas that we are working in the, the working group in situ, law and policy, the licensing issues. Uh, but again, we want to bring a series of examples from the year where uh, program. Um, and also uh, you will of course uh, know about this. Uh, we will publish it most likely in the GEO website. I look at there at the GEO secretariat. And, um, and yeah, you can, if you go to the next uh, slide, I think that is the last slide, so it's very short. Uh, you can see here the, the, the timeline. Uh, we will, it, it makes sense to start with a, with a more overall uh, overview of the data life cycle and then uh, focus on the data sharing principles, uh, data policies, data licensing. And then we can then focus on the more technical uh, management related issues in the, in the webinars uh, uh, after, the, after summer. So we can conclude this cycle by the Geo Week uh, in November. And as I was saying uh, before, we of course we will we will want to bring uh, more close to, uh, close to you what the principles mean, but we really want to bring uh, implementation examples and and also see how this relate with uh, other set of principles that are used in other communities at global, European, American, other regional level as well. Uh, I think that's all what I wanted to say, uh, Cathy. Um, and thanks a lot. I think there is now, maybe you will announce it, but there's going to be a poll, right? If I am not uh, mistaken. Uh, yes. But of course, should you, anyone have a, any question, you can always put it on the, on the chat and I will be very glad to respond. How likely are you to participate in the upcoming dialogue series? Now that you've seen this, please select an answer and hit submit and we'll see in real time what the answers are. I hope you all put five. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, there is a lot of uh, back and forth in the chat about um, sending in um, examples and other inputs. Uh, Bentalilia B is also available to take examples. Um, so please don't be shy. We're, we're here to learn from you. And the more feedback we get from you, the better. I also want to take a moment to give a big thank you to Paula. Paula has organized this from the beginning, and she's been the speaker wrangler and the um, person who is um, doing all the organization, the titles, the hounding people for their presentations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Paula, thank you. Um, okay, let's close the poll and see what we've got. And we'll get Lionel Menard ready for the E-Shape data management. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Cathy. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for attending. This session and give me the opportunity to present um, a contribution that uh, we're going to make um, to GEO as a form of um, data management plan tool. It's a self-assessment tool that uh, we have been developed in the framework of an um, eShape project 
And uh, thanks to my colleague, Nicolas Fichot, we've been able to uh, capture this and to grab this into a, a tool that you can use in practice. And I will uh, show you some, uh, some example about how the, this tool is, uh, is working. So next slide. Uh, so first, uh, one, two slides regarding the context and the support project. So eShape, eShape stands for EOGEO Showcases Application Powered by Europe. It's a European contribution to GEO in order to establish the regional EuroGEO. So you see the number, it's a very big project, a lot of partners. It will end up in a year from now. We, Armin, are the coordinator and my colleague Thierry Ranchin, that uh, some of you already know, is the scientific coordinator of this project. We have a website where you can find some more detailed information. And you can see that in this project, we have a lot of pilots. We are currently, uh, developing in the row 37, which are split in seven showcase. You see the, the nice icons that um, basically describe the showcase. So think of in this showcase as the similar thing to SBA, social benefit area in, in GEO. And we are in the course of the project on board 10 new pilots, so new fresh blood ID and challenges with 50 kilo euro grant each. So next slide. So in each shape, we want to develop operational EO service with and for the user, so this is a user-driven type of approach. We want to demonstrate the benefit of, uh, for this EO pilot to use and exploit EO data. We want to make sure that we promote the uptake of the pilot in market, whether they are private or, or public. And we want to uh, enable us, uh, what we call a long-term sustainability, whether the pilot are in public or in private market and raising awareness, dissemination, outreach activity, which I am currently doing now. Next slide. So if we uh, jump directly in the data management plan, which is the topic of this uh, presentation. So uh, the, the associated data policy in eShape were basically based on GEO because we are a contribution to GEO and to FAIR because we are sponsored by the Euro European Commission, which is promoting the FAIR principles. So we have run four phase with this uh, data management plan uh, activity. So the first phase, was to run an initial assessment and to know what about the familiarity of the pilots regarding FAIR and GEO. And there was not a lot. So we have conducted some webinar in order to build comprehension. I thank Bob Chen and Bob Down who has participated to those webinars as well as the support of the next GEO's European funded project. Then on the second phase, we have developed a tool which is in Excel to provide a canvas in order to capture the DMPs for FAIR and GEO, and as well to introduce two new, uh, basically, concepts, the compliance level and the trajectory. I will say uh, something in more detail in the next slide. Then we have assess, evaluate, and compile this uh, picture of the status in the third phase. And now we are finishing the fourth phase, where at the end of April uh, 2022, sorry, there's a mistake there, we have uh, 35 DMPs that were received. 33 of them did two loop uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, revamping their, their input. And you see the number about the compliance across geo data management principle, nearly 70% splitted uh, in the detail uh, regarding each of the geo DMPs. And as well for FAIR, uh, regarding findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which is quite good to be uh, improved as well. But I think it's a, these are very good number. And in practice, all of the, the, the pilot have done, at least 35 of them done this uh, DMP assessment. So, so um, the, the, the basis of this were the, the geo data sharing principle implementation guideline, where some uh, initial analysis have found that there are room for basically, um, let's say, uh, overlap between geo data management principle and FAIR. And you see those, those uh, pictures, which has been known for you for many years. But we have put it into practice, basically. And from there, you have a screen copy of the spreadsheet in Excel, that, uh, that is the basis of the tool, where on the left side, you see that in FAIR 3, what you have already filled in GeoDMP3 is basically provide you uh, as a kind of, let's say, uh, in order to uh, avoid you the burden of basically try to re-enter the same information. This is the same for 
fair for, where you can go back to edit DMP4, DMP5, and DMP10. So we try to provide a tool which could be basically helpful to basically get the, the, the information to, to be collected in an easy and non-repetitive manner as much as we can. Then we have introduced two additional elements. So basically, these were for the project in order to monitor the compliance and the trajectory, so the document improvement during the course of reshape. But we found that those elements could be of interest. So the compliance level for some of the questions of the DMPs allow you to basically uh, enter if your pilot or your application and regarding the given DMP question is applicable, applicable but not started, partially implemented or fully compliant. And then the trajectory as the project was split in two sprints. We want to monitor this and I think it is very an interesting addition to uh, basically monitor uh, any DMPs because you can move, you can start saying maybe it is applicable but not started. And then at the end of a given period, you can say it is fully or partially implemented. So in practice, you see that when you finish to edit, so you see all the tabs in the, the at the end uh, on the bottom of the slide. So you, you go tab by tab and at the end you have finished your DMP and you can basically in a single click export to Word, uh, next slide. And you end up, I save it into a, basically a PDF. You end up with a fully, uh, let's say, complete data management plan, which basically is taking both FAIR and GeoDMP that you can provide to your uh, funder or to do any uh, internal brainstorming regarding your own process and your own data. You see that in this uh, slide, we have basically tried to revamp, try to basically generalize the, the, the DMP in order to avoid the, basically all the eShape reference, though we have some of the eShape logo, but the, you see that the start and the finish has been replacing the so-called sprint one and sprint two. So we have tried to generalize basically the, the tool to be basically more suited for the community. So, so I will briefly, next slide, show you some of the initial uh, status and compliance level at the end of the sprint one, a year from now. So you see that across the DMP, we have some percentage for the 37 pilot regarding their compliance, whether it is not applicable up to fully compliance. And next slide. And you see that the trajectory now show that there is an improvement. I think it is a very interesting thing to monitor, saying that you can start with answering some question or maybe not understanding the question, but move into a trajectory to basically try to reach a higher level of compliance regarding GeoDMP. We have done, next slide, the same for FAIR. So for the sake of time, I only present the FAIR one, so make, making data findable. So we start with this a percentage regarding the fair one. And if you go to the next slide, so you see that there's an improvement definitely regarding this uh, fair one and two into, into the matrix. So everything is not equal. So there are some more tricky, maybe uh, let's say activity to conduct where uh, for search and discovery, it is quite okay. But if you go from traceability, it uh, can be a bit more tricky, but this is interesting to monitor. So the lesson learned so far, so we have um, a large variety of EO sector, you see the seven showcase, so basically a lot of pilot as well, 37, and we have had received good feedback on the usefulness and the simplicity of the tool. So it is Excel, so of, I know it is not definitely, when you talk about Excel in this community that claim to have a recommendation on interoperability, it's not a good start, but it has proven to be useful and, and, and simple. And I will go to, to some follow-up in the next slide, but it, it was a good feedback we see so far. Um, we found that the DMP is a very powerful formal framework to brainstorm about your data and service. So either you do it internally or for the, the, the sake of providing this DMP to a funders, basically try to answer the question of those DMP regarding your input, your output, your process is definitely a plus. We found the notion of data versus service to not be straightforward in the guideline of the GeoDMP and the FAIR. Mostly they are inherited from data uh, era. So the service is not that well, uh, let's say, represented and well explained. So in practice, you must know that it is not easy to reply to all DMP questions. They are very tricky and you need to be aware of this. But at the end, the tool helped to reward and reward you with an automatic DMP generation. So uh, as a contribution, we have conducted this uh, three years dynamic geo uh, and fair DMP assessment. Uh, we have found that the compliance and trajectory concept could be really powerful. And I put an open question. Can we move this concept forward in this group and 
more generally in, in GODMP and FAILS. Um, we have currently put extra effort in order to polish and to add genericity to the tool. So we want to provide a template mechanism that will allow you to put your own logo, to put your own, let's say, introduction page at the beginning of the DMP, and then to enter the DMP in order to be more suitable for your own use. The tool is available to the GEO community. So we are going to put an announcement from the GEO website with a link to download the Excel tool. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, so I think Excel is good. It could be a good starter, but we want to move forward from Excel into deploying the geo data management principle into an integrated and centralized platform. And we currently are conducting some discussion with Paola from the Secretariat with the French National Research Institute in order for them who are already specialized in providing those DMP to basically add the geo data management principle in the portfolio of their supporting DMP tools. And I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much. We have another poll coming out. Please make sure you answer it. This is a wonderful tool and we want to see if anyone is actually interested on this call is actually interested in doing a self-assessment to please contact these folks and uh, let them know that you're interested, but please do fill out the poll. Okay, so we're going to move along to Simon Hudson, making data work for cross-domain grand challenges. And then we have one additional presentation after that, and then we're going to do, have a few minutes for Q&A, I hope. Simon? Thanks very much, Kathy. Hello, everyone. I'm Simon Hudson, Executive Director of CoData. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank Bapon Fakharuddin, who's a member of the Data Working Group, and I think also the Disaster Risk Reduction um, or Disaster Working Group, um, who suggested that I give this talk in this session. And I hope that it's of interest, because what I'd like to address is some work that CoData has been doing with partners on cross-domain interoperability and how that can be applied to research projects and to the creation of research tools or research data sets and policy oriented data sets, um, which are important for, for example, the SDGs, for the Sendai uh, framework and for the geo um, societal benefit goals. So I hope that it's of, of interest to this community. CoData is the Committee on Data of the International Science Council. Um, and we exist to serve the mission of the International Science Council to support um, that mission of advancing science as a global public good. And we do that by addressing issues of data policy, data science and data training. We're one of two uh, participating organizations in GEO that are also entities of the International Science Council, the other one being the World Data System. Thank you. Um, this is just a quick slide to say briefly what our strategic activities were. I've already mentioned we do work on data policies and somewhere on that you can see um, some work that we did for GEO a few years ago on the value of open data sharing. Um, we, do, we have a data policy committee. We do various uh, reports and studies on data policy issues. We do work on data science and data skills. We have a flagship strategic activity, which we call Making Data Work for Cross-Domain Grand Challenges, and that's what I'm going to speak about today. Next slide, please. So as I said, we're part of the International Science Council, and we've been um, entrusted, if you like, with a part of the International Science Council's action plan um, to address this issue of Cross the main grand challenges, and above all, the availability and the interoperability and usability of data for those for those areas. Now, the rationale for that is is there in the second bullet on this slide that the major pressing global scientific and human issues um, of the twenty first century can only be addressed through research that works across disciplines to understand complex systems and which uses interdisciplinary and sometimes transdisciplinary approaches to turn data into knowledge and then into action. And I think that rationale underpins quite a lot of GEO's thinking also about the societal benefit areas and the need to combine remote sensing data with in-situ data and then how we turn that into policy 
and to action. And within that nexus of challenges, we're particularly concerned with applying the FAIR principles and also trying to push the envelope, if you like, on the application of those FAIR principles. Um, we've heard a lot already about data management plans, about self-assessments. Um, we need to be clear that the FAIR principles are challenging and we're making great progress since they were published in 2016. And I think they've been very helpful in pushing the policy agenda in relation to data. But by the same token, we need to be more ambitious, I think. It's easy to make data findable with discovery metadata. Some of the issues around accessibility are also easy to address. But issues of interoperability, how we combine data sets within a domain and indeed how we combine data sets from a variety of sources for cross domain research areas remains a significant challenge. So this is what we've, um, we've been entrusted to address. We've been doing some preparatory work over the last two to three years, a series of workshops at the Dark Stool Center with task groups and working groups, um, looking at issues around units, units of measurement, looking at issues around vocabularies, around data structure and data description. And we've, we're very fortunate to be able to take that work forward now in a European Commission funded project called Worldfare, which I'll mention towards the end of this, this um, talk. So I'll describe some of the work that we've been doing and then introduce the Worldfare project. And the, the purpose of this presentation is to invite participation from participating organizations and geo members and the geo community at large. And I'll, I'll suggest some ideas of how uh, that might happen. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we're particularly focused on is interoperability. We've developed a methodology in um, the preliminary work for this activity. Um, we're exploring issues of core interoperability or cross-domain interoperability. Um, on the one hand, we're testing that with international scientific unions and representatives of particular disciplines, and also testing that with cross-domain case studies. So we hope there's a sort of a virtuous circle in that methodology, as I say, exploring issues of, of, uh, of interoperability and testing those with two different types of, of case studies. The sort of work we've been doing is on, as I mentioned, um, units of measurement, looking at FAIR vocabularies, what makes terminologies that can be referenced on the web FAIR. And one of our colleagues, uh, Simon Cox, as a result of one of our working groups with, uh, with, with other colleagues produced a, um, a set of recommendations, 10 simple rules for FAIR vocabularies, which we think is, is Im important. Um, we've been looking with the DDI Alliance on cross-domain integration and a metadata specification that deals with the variable cascade, the relationship between concepts and variables and measurements and how we, we track that in a data set and looking at data structure to make the integration of data more um, machine actionable. Um, and we're exploring issues around with partners around fair digital objects and fair implementation profiles. And then all the time testing these with um, case studies, but in particular cross domain case studies, things like disaster risk reduction, things like sustainable cities. And I'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. Next slide, please. So this leads us on to the World Fair project, which builds on that. Um, this is a two year uh, project funded by the European Commission, 2 million um, euros. Um, we're finalizing the grant agreement at the moment and it'll start on the 1st of June. Um, the Research Data Alliance is a core partner in this and we'll be testing some of their recommendations and outputs in relation to FAIR um, in this project as well. But above all, as I say, we want to work on this idea of um, a cross-domain interoperability framework. We're working in the project, we will be working with a set of 11 case studies from a range of different domains. Um, and they're clustered there in that petal diagram. There's a set which relate to chemistry and its application, chemistry, nanomaterials, geochemistry, um, a set looking at uh, social sciences and health science in various ways, social surveys, population health. Um, that's a case study which looks at COVID data 
at the population and at the population level and in clinical um, in the clinical context and in urban health um, and then perhaps areas which are more immediately relevant to um, the geo community biodiversity and agricultural biodiversity looking at pollinators and a set of case studies on ocean sciences and sustainable development on disaster risk reduction and on um, cultural heritage and how we describe artifacts. Each of those case studies will do a fair implementation profile so we understand with what sort of data they use, how they describe it, what sort of identifiers and metadata schemas they use, what sort of vocabularies, and then test this idea of the cross-domain interoperability framework to see whether describing the data structure, the relation to the variable cascade that I've, that I've mentioned, to what extent that helps them with combining data within their research more effectively within their research projects. We've got sessions um, at Cydaticon International Data Week and at a Fair Convergence Symposium in October. Next slide, please. And this is my uh, last substantive slide. There's some more information about those case studies um, for those of you that are um, interested in that. And I think there are areas there which are of um, direct relevance to uh, GEO. As this project goes forward, and because from a co-data perspective, we see that as sitting in this larger initiative, um, which, I, which I mentioned at the beginning, which we've been entrusted with as part of the um, International Science Council's action plan, within the capacity of the project and the coordinating team, we would be very keen to explore additional petals on that flower and whether we can identify, for example, with the GEO community, um, case studies, which are part of the GEO work plan, uh, uh, a part of GEO activities, which could nevertheless also contribute to the World Fair project and initiative and could be useful case studies um, or useful additional petals to that. And the purpose of that would be to unpick some of the issues around data combination and data integration in the societal benefit areas from a geo perspective and specifically how we more effectively combine at scale in a more automated way, remote sensing data with in situ data with social science data in order to make um, better tools, resources for researchers and for policymakers. So that's the appeal and that's where I hope that this uh, work as it goes forward might be of interest. So I'll close with a plug for International Data Week, which is taking place in June. I, I see, unfortunately, that it's going to be the same week as the GEO Governing Board. Apologies for that. But I will say that um, your Director of Secretariat, Jano Gavorgian, um, who I think I saw on this um, in this meeting, um, has very kindly to uh, agree to participate in one of the plenary panels um, at the opening of, the, of that uh, conference on the 20th of June. Um, so hopefully there's interest there, um, as well as the rest of the, the conference uh, for the GEO community. But in that conference, co-organized with the International Data, uh, with the Research Data Alliance, with the World Data System, we'll be addressing a number of issues relating to data management plans, to fair data, to data policy, all these things that have been mentioned already. And there'll be a number of sessions on the, um, on the World Fair project and some of the work that's in, that we're initiating as part of that. Um, thank you very much, Kathy. Next slide, please. I think that's the, um, thank you for your attention. And over to you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, Please, speakers, please check the chat. There have been some questions and comments that come up that don't require us to have the entire group discussion. Um, if there are any questions that are burning for you to answer or to ask the, uh, the speakers after the next presentation, please put them in the chat. Um, so finally, we have next slide, please. The magic question is, what value do the funders find in all of our work? And Costas, you've got a huge question to answer, so I will give you as much time as I can. Go for it. 
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kathy, and thanks everyone for this invitation. So uh, my name is Kostas Rapanas. I work at the European Commission at the Open Science Unit. Uh, that's at the Director General for Research and Innovation. And uh, at the European Commission, uh, we have open science uh, as a major priority, and um, we focus very much on open access to publications, uh, also sharing uh, early research outputs, making data fair and uh, engaging in research data management, also to achieve reproducible results and to be responsible uh, and, and, so, and engaged in uh, society. Uh, for that, we develop certain enablers, uh, such as the European Open Science Cloud that I hope many of you uh, know and are, are engaged with and also uh, skills and education and also different open science uh, practices. So one, one very big difference that um, uh, you, you can see from Horizon 2020 to the new program Horizon uh, Europe that will run for the next seven years is that uh, actually open science is starting slowly to be one of the factors that uh, the European Commission and our evaluators will actually look at uh, when someone is applying and to uh, both to be important both in the excellent criterion excellence criterion and in the quality and efficiency of implementation criteria so both of those are very important and uh, although we we do not do this from day one so that we do not disadvantage anyone uh, it will slowly gain more traction and you will see more and more questions coming up um, in evaluations and uh, all the, all the different open science practices will be uh, evaluated and rewarded. So, um, okay. uh, so uh, here are some of the uh, differences and changes in Horizon Europe, uh, all, always relative to Horizon 2020. So for example, a lot more uh, emphasis is given to uh, data management in line with the FAIR principles. Uh, we have uh, questions uh, in the data management plan that um, at the proposal stage is not a fully blown DMP, but it's a, a sort of one pager of initial considerations uh, that is being evaluated. And then the, um, the full data management plan is expected at uh, month six of the project, but we do want this to be a living document. We want this to be updated when uh, certain milestones are uh, achieved or when changes happen uh, in the project. So we also advocate for uh, making of course data fair and as open as possible, as close as necessary. When there are exceptions, um, we want to see those uh, described in the DMP. So the DMP is not only uh, an administrative <laughs> burden, but it's actually a very useful tool, both for the, the grant beneficiaries, uh, for the consortium, and also for the commission for the uh, reporting. And uh, can we go to the next? Um, another important point is uh, that we we also encourage. This is not a strict requirement, but it's uh, a great uh, encouragement to um, start sharing other outputs. So essentially, we do not talk anymore about the data management management plan, but we talk about an output management plan, uh, essentially, because uh, we want to see uh, research outputs such as software code. Uh, protocols, workflows, or models to be also uh, described in the DMP and shared through repositories. Uh, and of course, this can be also, uh, you know, have a DOI, they are digital objects, and they can be made available for others to reuse. Um, on top of that, there are certain cases where uh, we can have also physical objects that can be shared, and this can also be part of the data management plan. And there is this ambition that uh, slowly we are uh, more and more, uh, a bit more uh, vocal about it, that all these outputs, uh, such as software, for example, become first class uh, outputs uh, on par with publications and data. And I will talk in my last slide a bit about how we, we value this in the whole context of reforming the research assessment system. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this doesn't show very well, so apolog apologies for that, but. Uh, just to highlight that um, a great value is given to trusted repositories in Horizon Europe. So although we do not um, have, let's say, a, a list of uh, repositories, we do have certain uh, properties that we expect those uh, repositories to, to have, such as, for example, to assign uh, PIDs, permanent uh, identifiers, uh, to have to ask for detailed metadata, 
uh, hopefully standardized and, and if possible machine readable and, and certain other um, qualities. And um, we, do, we do make some recommendations uh, depending on uh, different communities and different disciplines. For example, in the life sciences, we recommend the Elixir deposition databases. And actually here's a, a question or, or a task, if you wish, for, for the GEO community that um, if you could formulate uh, some sort of recommendation for the uh, data types that uh, your community uh, generates, we would be more than happy to include this in our um, revision of, of our guidelines for Horizon Europe. Uh, so we do work with different communities. So while trying to be as generic as possible, um, covering all the different data types and different disciplines, we do value uh, feedback and input coming from the communities, and we are happy to include recommendations in our guidelines. Uh, so just a quick word about, I mean, we are still in this pandemic of COVID-19, but what did we learn? Uh, we have seen that, in fact, open science can accelerate scientific discovery and that fair and open data can save lives. And I do not say this lightly. We have seen uh, great practices uh, such as uh, sharing uh, research results through uh, preprints. We have seen, in fact, an explosion of uh, preprints compared to uh, the traditional uh, publication model. And we have seen uh, data sharing and working in the open, such as with the Galaxy project. This is bioinformatics um, in the bioinformatics community, where uh, real-time analysis of, of sequencing data was happening across uh, the globe. And we have even seen traditional publishers making uh, articles open, uh, although I'm afraid that <laughs> this will be uh, stopped when we are sort of out of the pandemic. But uh, indeed, if we want to make uh, open science the new normal, as we like to say, uh, one of the big bets uh, for the European Commission and globally, I have to say, is to reform the research assessment and to provide different rewards, different incentives and to value um, and credit those researchers, those scientists for um, engaging with the open science practices. This is just a very quick, I will not go through everything, but uh, this was really something that uh, the European Commission together with uh, Elixir and Emily BI did um, at the very start of the pandemic. And indeed we have seen how fair and open data in action can help and can uh, accelerate research. So we set up this uh, platform that is being used uh, actually all around the world. So the name is European, but it's actually a global uh, global effort. And we have reached uh, several milestones. Uh, actually now there's more than uh, 10 million records, uh, all open access. Although there are there is a small number of um, uh, sort of restricted access data because we have to respect also uh, for example, when, when uh, patient data are involved. Um, but still, even those data that are restricted can be fair. So there is a distinction to be made there. And my final slide, uh, please, is about the research assessment. So this is really a, a very, very um, big initiative. Uh, different disciplines are involved, different organizations. We have already about uh, more than 350, I believe now, uh, organizations that have joined this coalition of, of the willing. Um, these are uh, research performing organizations, uh, universities, other funders, agencies. So uh, we model a lot of the, uh, the values of this coalition after DORA, the Declaration of Research Assessment. And um, we, we believe, although it's a very, very difficult and tricky area, uh, the current system is, is, of course, very, very well established, but um, we believe that uh, if there is enough interest, and we have, we have seen the initial signs that there is interest uh, to move away from uh, evaluating only publications and impact factors, but to uh, actually uh, start developing a, a whole range of different metrics that uh, uh, credits data producers, uh, data curators, um, people that share openly their code and tools can be built on top. And uh, I believe also in your community, in the GEO community, this is very, very important. You have been pioneers in uh, 
establishing uh, data sharing guidelines. So I think it's something that uh, if your organizations are not involved, it is very, very good to, to be involved. And uh, we hope to, to have a draft of this um, uh, sort of um, uh, coalition uh, statement uh, towards the, the fourth quarter of, of this year. So stay tuned for that. And the link is live, by the way, you can have more information. And uh, also, I, I just put something in the chat there uh, when Simon mentioned the, the World Fair project. And this is a, a really key project, I believe, because we can exploit this to uh, focus on cross-discipline interoperability. Simon said it very well. It's one of the uh, trickiest parts to get right, but uh, we cannot expect to have everything <laughs> interoperable with everything else. But uh, if we focus on specific use cases of uh, this data type, we want to interoperate with that data type. I think there is where we can have some easy wins and um, showing the, the way forward for others. So thank you very much. I hope <laughs> I was on time. And if there are any questions, happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Costas. You were good. Um, all right, so we have one final poll that we're gonna have leave open for five minutes. We're gonna go a little bit over our allotted time so that we can get your feedback on this very important funding question. Uh, and you all get to hear my dogs putting in their two cents on the funding as well. Um, so just going through the um, presentations, there have been a lot of wonderful points coming up. Can, does anyone have any general questions for the speakers that have not been put in the chat at this point? Please raise your hands if you do. I'm not going to call on my dogs. They're really not going to add anything useful to the discussion. <laughs> I will start this off while you're all um, filling out the poll. Uh, just a general question to, for anybody who wants to answer this. Um, we're talking a lot about open data. We're talking a lot about care and fair and all of these other paradigms. And we talk about standards. Are all of these um, paradigms and standards actually moving fast enough? Are they keeping up with the realities of data sharing um, in real time? Or are we still lagging behind in any aspect? And I'm going to uh, have that Anyone who wants to answer in the speakers today, go for it. Helen? Yeah, go on then, Kathy. I, I'll yeah. jump in. Um, I, I think what I would say is maybe, I, I, maybe I'll turn that question slightly on its side and, and ask how GEO can make some of these things move faster to fulfill some of the issue, to actually help support some of the issues that perhaps we identified in the survey and the engagement calls, because I think, and, and Simon alluded this to this in his presentation, I think there is a recognition that we need to be thinking about fair care and trust in GEO and in the GEO work program activities, but actually how they're applied within those work program activities is, is an issue because um, Simon mentioned this before, I think, there is a recognition that we are generally the FNA of FAIR, for example, is moving along at a pace that is um, what's needed. But I think in terms of the interoperability and the reusability, I think what came out of the survey and the engagement calls does demonstrate that perhaps the I and R of FAIR, for example, is not moving as fast as we need it to because we are talking about interoperability and reusability of data, but actually all of the tools that we need in our toolkit to actually make that happen are not yet quite there. I don't know whether Simon wants to jump in because I think, I think he, he made some of these observations in his, in his presentation actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, I just started typing actually. I mean, um, A, 
I've I've sometimes been caught up by by commentators who've or colleagues who've said who've pushed back when I said that we're we get, getting a lot of things right with A as well. Basic download access across the web, yes. Computational access for large data sets, less so. Um, intelligently controlled access to some parts of a data set which can be accessed but where other parts need to be protected because of sensitive data etc a lot less so so there are significant challenges there um, and I didn't I didn't cover so much trust um, and and care these are important sets of principles. I think there's also a lot of something I perhaps should have mentioned as well as the UNESCO recommendation, which um, I would hope would be, if not a, a game changer, a significant further stepping stone over and above the geo data sharing principles and the data management guidelines. It's another step which, which underlines the importance of open data and open science for um sustainable development um for want of for want of a a, a a better word um but sort of getting back to the sort of geo community and the data management plans and how we can sort of respond to that we need to take on on board um the ethical issues and the, the social issues some of which are encapsulated in fair in care rather um i think we need to think about how care is adapt you know i think care is an important set of principles but it's very much owned by the indigenous data community and we need to think about what we can learn for that and adapt um, adapt it to other human circumstances as well but i also think that there's a you know an opportunity and a big challenge for the geo community in improved more detailed description of data such that those data can be more readily combined and I think we need to look at what is being done on a piecemeal basis by particular projects, the Earth Cube sort of approach, the, um, the CAS Earth approach that we're liaising with, how we combine data sets which are directly related to societal benefit areas and or sustainable development goals, and then learn from that such that those lessons can be more easily applied by by other other communities. Uh, I don't know whether that quite um, responded to the question or the prompt, but um, it, it, uh, hopefully that's a useful observation. I, I, it did, yeah. I think the, the issues here are that, unfortunately, a lot of times groups, major groups tend to pick up issues as they've gained some sort of um, critical mass in the community and as such tend to lag in terms of a solution or a discussion or a solution. And so the question is, is really, have we found anything where in, in our own analysis where we can jump ahead and really pave the way for the other groups? Mm -hmm. um, and rather than let you answer that, I'm gonna cut you off. <laughs> we do have a question, um, to cost us, what is the post value assessment of the data management plan from the funder's perspective during and at the end of a project? And we all know that we want a data management plan, but how useful was it really when you look back at the project? Right, so um, first of all, we, we had a small study for uh, Horizon 2020 uh, DMPs and uh, you would be surprised, but one of the uh, interesting observations there was that actually a lot of the beneficiaries valued the data management plan for themselves and not, uh, you know, seeing it as a as a bureaucracy of the commission. Let's say so. Hmm. I think this is already quite quite valuable. We are gonna wait, uh, as you may imagine, a couple of years because Horizon Europe just started a few months ago. So we are now only getting the first uh, full DMPs for Horizon Europe. Uh, and uh, you may notice that in the template we we try to follow the fair principles. Uh, so actually, we are providing um, something like the ESA. In fact, so it's it's a way uh, to help beneficiaries uh, comply with um, uh, with the fair principles. And 
as we know, fair is is a continuum. It's not it's, it's a process, right? So uh, we don't want to to talk about okay compliance, black and white, but increasing fairness uh, gradually and uh, arriving to a point where data can be reused. That that's the whole aim. Uh, and for the funder, I think it's quite important to to go back and look. Um, you know, if there are in fact changes that we need to make to to the template. Uh, or if there are areas that are not uh, covered and should be. Uh, and something that we we are trying very hard, I don't know <laughs> when this will become a reality, but uh, the real value will be to have a machine actionable DMP. Uh, we have been doing some work with RDA. It's it's not there yet, I must say, but there are, there are quite some developments and essentially we want the beneficiaries to enter once and reuse multiple times. So basically, the, what they enter in a DMP goes to their continuous reporting. So to ease even more the burden of entering again and again, the same data for, for the project. So uh, I think this will be the, the real value. And um, a second element would be, we are encouraging now uh, beneficiaries grantees to start sharing DMPs. So there are places to publish DMPs. Uh, there are some platforms, there are journals, online journals or you know even just repositories where they can get the DOI. And I think this can be even um, more helpful for people that want to create a new DMP, but also for going back and seeing what did the project uh, sort of promise <laughs> that they yeah. were doing, what did they right. do in the end? <laughs> what were the data needs that, um, you know, we have an issue there with the post, uh, post project, um, management mm -hmm. of, of data that's why we try to push um, you know the position in repositories trusted repositories um, before the project ends so all these issues can, can be um, better tackled i think and of course uh, we are making available uh, the, the funding that is necessary so the better the dmp describes the needs for uh, data storage or data curation or you know, if, if a project has to hire for a certain time a data steward, um, you know this can be all all eligible costs. So um, I think slow, slowly good. we will see the slowly we will see the changes, but I think it's quite early for Horizon Europe still. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we we've got the DMP answers here from several people. Um, I think that reiterated some of the points that you just made, Costas. Um, we are at time right now. We are over time. So um, I really hate to cut this off. I wish we could keep going. This would be one of those sessions where if we were live, we would tell people who really wanted to leave to go and the rest of us would just keep chatting. Um, but we do have to leave. So I'd like you to join me in thanking all of our speakers um, thank you to the folks uh, working behind the scenes once again, to Paolo for arranging all of this. And thank you for those of you who got up as early as I did to, <laughs> to be, um, and who are not morning people, um, to be uh, with us in this presentation. Um, please make sure that you go back. If you get a chance real quick to save the chat, you can save the chat to your own computer. Um, if you wanna do that to keep these um, wonderful questions and notes and links and everything um, available. And we shall see you if at the next session. All right, thank you very much.